tired, but if you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of Matthew chapter 9. We're going to get there in just a moment. Um, but I, I think about camp and 600 kids, over 100 adult leaders, almost 700 people at camp. It was a little crowded at times. And I think about those moments in our life where, where maybe the crowds were a little bit bigger than we thought, right? Where you, you were at an event, you're at an experience, and you're like, it feels like people are stacked on top of each other. Anybody ever been to a venue like that where you're like, everywhere I move, I'm not sure if I'm going to step on somebody, walk, all that, my favorite word is excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, right? I've had those moments leaving an Ohio State Buckeyes football game, right, when 105,000 people are like, game over, let's go, and uh, so everybody's leaving at the same time, uh, and so it's like, it's a little crowd, and everybody's walking, and you're, you're, it's just crazy, and people are bumping into you, and it's okay, because you're all trying to get to the same destination, I had one of those moments a number of years ago. Uh, so our church takes a missions trip to New York City. I think this is going to be year five in a row that we've done this. Well, the first year we went, uh, we went with an organization, and they're taking us, and we get these subway cards because you don't drive, and you don't walk, and you just take subways everywhere you're going. And so they're like, hey, we're going to do these subways. It was, it was pretty normal uh, for the most part. But then there was this one subway where the doors open, and the guy who was with us goes, okay, let's get on. And I was like, It's full. Like, isn't this the moment where you're like, I'll wait for the next one. He's like, there's plenty of room. Just push through. I was like, no, this thing is full. Like, there's 12 of us trying to get on this car, this train, and it's jam-packed. He's like, plenty of room. Okay, we all get in, doors shut, like sucked in a little bit, like we're all going to fit, like sardines. I didn't have to worry about like hand, holding onto a handrail because there wasn't enough room for anyone to fall over anyway. But it was just that moment, like it was so, it was so tight. Like, you were bumping into people, and it was just the norm. Uh, when I was a, a young boy, my grandfather used to take me to uh, two Cleveland Browns games a year. And uh, so in the middle of winter, you know, there's no heat in the stadium. There's no dome. That may be changing. But, but then at the old municipal stadium, there's no dome. And so at halftime, it's your time to get warm, right? It's snowing. It's freezing outside. The only place in the entire stadium with heat is in the restrooms, well, this is, the, this, is the, this is the time in history where you were allowed to smoke indoors, and so you would open up the door to the men's room, hundreds, if not 500 people in one room, like the cloud of smoke would come out, you would walk in, and then you would have to go to what we would call like Petrov Palace, um, because it was just like a giant sink on the wall. Um, it, was, it was bad. Like, I don't know who had that job of cleaning up. The, after the game, but you couldn't pay me enough to do that, right? And so there's this moment where you're just like, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, and you're trying to weave your way through 500 drunk guys to be able to just use the bathroom. And when you're doing that, you're going to bump into people. People are going to touch you, uh, and it's gonna, you're like, man, this just, especially for someone who's an extreme introvert, it's like, this is crazy. Like, this is the most wildest thing that's ever happened to me because I feel like I'm stuck, and, and, it's, and people are everywhere. Well, one of the marvelous healings and unique healings uh, in, in the Bible is with the, the woman with the issue of blood. We see her account in Matthew chapter 9 and Mark chapter 5 and Luke chapter 8. She was facing that same type of crowd, right? That same type of environment where there's, there's hundreds, if, if possible, even thousands of people. Yet it's in that moment that we're going to read and we're going to see that, that she was different. When she reached out and touched Jesus, there was like, hey, Jesus wants to know who touched me. Like, hey, Jesus, there's, there's hundreds of people here that you're getting touched nonstop. How do you know that someone touched you? And so let's look at her story in Matthew chapter 9 and see if we can't gain some wisdom of what the Lord would want to speak to us this morning. So starting in verse 20, it says, just then a woman who had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding came up behind him. So this is, this is Jesus walking, crowds all around, and she is coming up behind him. She touched the fringe of his robe, okay, so the, the hem of his garment. For she thought, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, daughter, be encouraged. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was healed at that moment. Right? I think in the King James, it's, it's a straight way. Like it's, it's instantaneous. It's now. It's not, hey, this is coming a year from now, six weeks from now, two years, 12 years. This is, this is you touched me. Something supernatural has happened, and your faith now has made you well. I don't know about you, but I often wonder if I put myself in this woman's shoes or if I put myself in, in some of these accounts that we see because this isn't just a, oh, this is a great, wonderful biblical story. Right? This is real life. This is a real woman. This, is, this isn't just a fairy tale. This is someone who was, who was sick for 12 years. 
And now all of a sudden in this moment, she, she's sick, she's suffering, she's got to be sick physically, emotionally, communally. I mean, she, she's, she's cast away because she's unclean. She gets word of Jesus coming to town, and she's like, okay, Jesus is coming. If I could just touch him, I know that something powerful could happen. And she makes her way to him, and, and, and I understand, she's pushing past the cultural norms. It's not normal. Uh, it, it, Right? She, she, it's not normal for a woman to be able to touch a man. And this, this man is the king of kings. Like, this is Jesus. She's unclean, so she shouldn't even be in, anywhere near anybody. And yet she's going to push through the masses to be able to get to Jesus. And she touches him. And I, I'm not sure. The scripture doesn't say, so we don't want to lean into it and add to it. But if she's touching the hem and there's a crowd, was, was she on her knees? Was she crawling? Did she give her last effort and lunge you know, to get to that hem, to get to the bottom of that robe? But it's in that moment where she is healed. And Jesus wants to know who touched me. And sure enough, it's this woman. And Jesus reaches out and he connects with her. And it's in that moment that she finds healing. And it's in that moment of acknowledgement that all the labels she had carried, right, throughout her life, through the past 12 years, all those labels right there in that moment, not only did she receive a physical healing, but, but can you imagine what's coming off of her, those labels that she carried of being clean and untouchable and all the things that she had carried with her throughout her life are now removed. And so when we read the text, we got to understand that we're not just supposed to be hearers of the word, we're to be doers of the word. And so there's application, right? We're just not reading like, oh, that's a really great story, good for her, she got healed, bless the Lord. No, we look at it and we say, okay, Jesus, what is it that you have for me? What can we learn from her life that we can apply to ours? Right, what can we learn from her life? And so this morning we have three, three points, something that we can learn from this woman, and here's the first, if you're taking notes, is be willing to fight for God's best in your life. Notice how I said that. Be willing to fight for God's best, not your best, but God's best. This isn't like, oh man, I really want this and so I'm going to go earn it and then I'll purchase it. No, this is what is God's very best for your life? For her, she wanted to be healed from this issue of blood and so she had to fight for it. She just didn't say, okay, this is going to be great. I'm hoping that Jesus will heal me. Right? It wasn't in a lethargic way. Like She wasn't floating on a raft in a pool on a, a beautiful summer day. Like You know what? It would be great if just Jesus showed up at my house and, and spoke life over me while I'm just sitting here in my pool. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Right? Our, our pool temperature while we were gone at camp got to 97 degrees. So we have a hot tub in our backyard instead of a pool now. But it's great. I'm not complaining. All right? but, but here's the deal. Is, is there, was some, there was some action here. There was some movement. There was a fight for what was best for her in God's life and for her life. In Luke chapter 8, verse 42, it says, as Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him, right? So the crowd is coming, but she's just thinking, if I could just reach out, if I could just touch his hem, then I could be healed. Do you see the evidence of the faith? Do you see the evidence of the fight? As in, there's a crowd, but I'm willing to do whatever it takes in order to push through to see Jesus. Do we have that same type of Holy Spirit fight in our life for the things of God? Do we have that same type of hunger and thirst for his righteousness, the chase after him? Because almost nothing of value we desire comes without resistance. Right? We have a desire, but, but there's resistance. This, this thing of following after Jesus is not always going to be easy. Right? There's going to be a fight. The woman with the issue of blood had obstacles that stood in her way from her healing. And it, people all around, the massive crowd. Maybe it was an, uh, the, the turmoil with inside, and so now there's this struggle. We look at someone like Zacchaeus, and, and there may be people standing in between you and your blessing. And I'm not saying you have to fight them. Like, no, I'll knock them out. I'll win this battle. Like, ah, in Jesus' name. All right, like, like, we spoke the name this morning. Let's go. Uh, I'm not talking about that kind of fight, but I'm talking about a, a, a fight that says I'm not willing to take no for an answer. Hey, there may be a lot of people around here, but I, I want to see Jesus, and so what am I going to do? I'm going to take advantage of this tree, and I'm going to climb a tree, and I want to see Jesus, and Jesus, I see you, and Jesus sees me, and all the mo in the moment, what? Now I get to be able to, you know what, Zacchaeus? I'm coming to your house today. I'm going to hang out with you. And so he's able to see and receive that blessing, and he pushed through those obstacles. Sometimes I think we want the benefits of the blessing without the battle of the blessing. Right? We're, we're, we're willing to receive it, but don't, don't make me work for it. Just give it to me, right? We're like the, the prodigal son. Like, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna have to earn or work for my inheritance. Father, just give it to me. I just want it now so I can use it for what? For me instead of for you. But remember, we have to be willing to fight for God's best and not our best in our life. There may be 
there may be distractions between you and your calling. I right? think about Nehemiah. Right, as he's rebuilding the temple walls, and, and he's, he's, he's working at it, and he's doing it, and all of a sudden a group of people come along, and they're like, hey, Nehemiah, why don't you come down? Right, and they're in the valley of, oh, no. Like, oh, no, I'm not coming down. Like, I have things to do. There's work to be done. I can't be distracted between what, what the Father's will is for my life, what's best for me and for him in my life. And so sometimes there's the distractions that come in between us and our calling. Or maybe sometimes there's bitterness before our forgiveness. Right? Jesus, when he's on the cross, what's he say? He says, Father, forgive them for what? They, they don't know what they're doing. And maybe we've allowed bitterness to creep in instead of forgiveness. And so maybe there's an obstacle, right? There's some things in our way in order, that are hindering us from being able to forgive, and that's bitterness. And, and I wonder if, if we take into account this, this woman's life, if we can learn that, man, man, we have to fight for God's best in our life. I can't imagine the physical obstacles all the people gathering around. I'm sure she was weak. I'm sure she was tired, right? If you've, if you've ever been sick for, if you've ever had the man flu for more than 10 hours, you know what it's like to be sick and tired, right? You just, you need somebody else to go get your food, your water, all that. You know what I'm talking about? The lady, ladies are like, oh, I know, <laughs> right? That's called a cold, and we push through. <laughs> but, we, but we get that. So she, there's physical limitations. There's people. She's probably tired. She's weak, and yet she's pushing through. I wonder if she thought, how can I get his attention? Well, I get trampled over by the crowd. I mean, all these things are possible. Then we look at the emotional obstacles she had to push through. She had been this way for over a decade. Right? This, is, this is something that she had struggled with day in and day out. I wonder if she was lonely, scared. Right? So she's unclean, and so she can't have these types of relationships that you and I have. And so maybe there was even relational obstacles. She was unable to connect with others because, because she was unclean. And defiled, and so so she would have she wouldn't have what we have. I mean, a couple of years ago we were in quarantine, but we at least had digital ways to connect. She had none of those, right? And for for myself, it was even I think I mentioned this like when we first came back and had that first service. It was like, man, I and I'm not a hugger, but it was like after four months of being away in isolation, it was like someone just hugged me, right? Uh, but, but I can't imagine it being that way for 12 years. And so there's there's physical, there's emotional, there's relational obstacles. But regardless of what it is, having to struggle doesn't necessarily mean that what you want for God's best in your life isn't true. And it's not that it's not God's will. Because you're going to have to fight. Because it's not always going to be easy. And, and fighting, fighting for us is, is such an important lesson. And sometimes I think it's countercultural. Where, where no, everything should just be given. Every, you just, everything's, everything's a handout. No, you got to work. You have to go after it. You have to do your part. God's always going to do his part. But are you willing to do your part? And so this woman with the issue of bud is pushing through and she's, she's reaching after her healing. I think of the Old Testament, the children of Israel. Right? There's, there's, there's Egypt and, and God's like, I'm going to pull you out of Egypt and you've been enslaved and I'm, I want to send you to freedom. And I, man, I got a promised land for you. It's flowing with milk and honey. It's going to be great. And so when you get there, just understand there's some people living there. So you're going to have to fight. But it's your land. Right, there was the blessing, and they want the blessing, but don't make me battle for it. And so if, there's a delay, 40 years. Why? Because they weren't willing to go enter in. There was, a, there was this struggle of, man, I want to receive it, but I don't really want to fight for it. And I wonder if that's something for us to be able to learn, is that, that God is asking us to start moving in faith. Will you start moving in faith? Will you, will you and, I, and trust me, I hear it, and I get it. Like, maybe we should pray. I, I'm not saying you shouldn't pray. But I wonder if we should stop expecting God to move when he's called us to action. You know what I'm talking about? Like, like we want, God, I want, just want you to move. He's like, I will. Will you take the first step? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm praying about it. Well, that's great. I, I want you to pray about it. And I, and, I, and I understand that it may not be the right time, but in the right time. But in the waiting Will you continue to seek me? Will you start moving in faith? I love in Luke chapter 8, verse 48, Jesus said to her, your faith has healed you. This was, this was her going after God with a hunger and, and with a passion. And so it was, it was a position of waiting. And some of you may find yourself in a position of waiting. And you may be waiting on God. But did you ever think that God is waiting on you? Right? No, 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 I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting for God to move, but maybe God is waiting for you to move. Maybe God is walking through town, 
And today it's up to you to to get up out of your seat, to leave your comfort zone, to have a little battle, a little bit of fight, a little bit of passion, and a little bit of hunger to just be able to reach out to experience him like never before today. Do we have that type of hunger to be able to reach out and to go after him? Are you willing to fight for God's best in your life? And surely if anybody could have made an excuse, it would have been this woman. Like, man, I'm tired. I battled. It's a long road. And I'm just weak. If, if he loved me, wouldn't he just show up to my house? I mean, wouldn't he go out of his way to just lavish that love on me? Can I tell you, church, don't allow the distractions to keep you from your destiny. Right? Don't allow the distractions to keep you from your destiny. God's got his pleasing, perfect, and holy will for your life, and distractions will happen. If I could just unpack the last 72 hours for you this morning, which I can't, it, you would go, oh, there was a lot of distractions. Yes. Lots of distractions, lots of issues, lots of things, lots of, lots of trips back and forth. But, it, but sometimes those distractions will keep us from our ultimate destiny. The second principle, if you're taking notes this morning, that we can learn from this woman is don't give up so easily. Don't give up so easily. Your persistency leads to his victory. Did you hear me? Your persistency leads to his victory. This isn't, this isn't about you winning. It's about him winning in you and through you. But you have to have some persistency. You have to have that internal like, fight within you that says, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to stop. Uh, in, in Mark chapter 5, verse 26, the other biblical account, it says she had suffered a great deal from many doctors. So she's, I don't know how many, but for many doctors over the years, she had spent everything she had to pay them. But she had, the scripture says she had what? Gotten no better. I would encourage you this morning, if you fail, try again, right? If you fail, try again. Perhaps one of the most significant lessons we can learn from this woman is that she kept trying again and again and again. It's so important that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that they all give this account that she had suffered for 12 years. She had spent money over and over, but she was not getting any better. But that didn't stop her, did it? She didn't make the excuse. She said, oh man, Jesus is coming. I've heard of him. I've heard of his notoriety. I've heard of his fame. I've heard of his glory. I've heard he's the healer. And if he's coming, then I want to give him a shot. Did you, did you ever think when you read this account, maybe it's because she tried something different? Right? She had been to the doctors, and I'm not saying going to the doctors is wrong. She had been to the doctors. She had tried year after year, time after time, money after money. But sometimes I think we get stuck in spiritual ruts of insanity where we keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Like, I don't understand. I don't understand why I'm not growing in my faith. I mean, I haven't read my Bible in three months, but it just doesn't make sense. Like, I show up to grow group. I mean, I haven't done any of the work, but I expect God to do something. We've said it. You will get out of it what you put into it. Right? There, there is a fight. There is a, there is a man within me I don't want to give up so easily. And so often we look at failure as if failure is something that, is, that means it's impossible for God. It's possible. It's just the wrong way or the wrong timing. That's all. But sometimes we give up and we're like, man, I just, I just don't want to lean into that. But understand, past failures can lead to tomorrow's victory. Right? You, you failed in the past. But that doesn't mean you can't have victory tomorrow, right? I gave back into that addiction. I struggled. I fell again. Great. That means tomorrow's a new day of victory. That means you can start with another number day one that will lead to day two, to day three, to day four, to day 100, to year one, year two, year three. But that means you can't give up. You have to continue to persevere. You got, you got to give it some effort. You got to have a mindset that says, I'm not, I'm not willing to quit. The woman with the issue of blood kept pursuing she kept pursuing. The book of Mark, it says she had suffered a great deal from many doctors. Right? She, she goes after this, and we see, we see this struggle, and she, she has these traditional methods. And I'm not saying traditional methods don't work, but she tries something different. But I wonder if, if those methods would have, ne- would, have, would, have never, would have worked if she would have leaned in the way she did. Or she'd be like, well, that's good enough. That's close enough. That's more than enough, because I feel a little bit better. But, but I wonder if the benefit of our natural attempts in failing pushes us to pursue supernatural attempts. How many know what I'm talking about? 
And again, I'm not saying, I think if you're sick, you should go to the doctor. I'm not saying you just, well, no, I'm never going to use modern medicine. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is if you've exhausted everything on your own, have you ever tried taking it to the Lord? Or maybe we, we take it to the Lord and the natural. But somehow we get stuck in, I have to do this on my own. No, you don't have to do it on your own. The Lord is willing to fight with you for you. He's willing to go in front of you, behind you, to the side of you. But you have to be willing to push in. You have to be willing to fight. You have to say, man, I'm not going to give up. She, should have, she would have been tired, lonely. Yet it's in that moment she has enough faith to just reach out. Have enough faith to just be able to reach out. If I could just nick, if I could get that close to him. Jesus is coming and I'm not, supposed, I'm not supposed to be out in this crowd. I'm supposed to be stuck in my home and I'm not supposed to touch him. But I just know if I have this type of faith that God could truly heal me. And she touches him, and it's in that moment, in that instant, she finds healing. And it's in that moment where Jesus sees her and he recognizes her. Who touched me? I wonder if God would challenge you to have that same type of hunger that this woman has. That same type of passion that says, God, I'm not going to settle for anything less than your very best in my life. God, I'm not going to give up the fight. I want to continue to persevere and and seek you with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. The third thing that we can learn from this woman is is we we can expect God to move. You can expect God to move. How many know that God has a pretty good track record of moving? Right? And I'm not saying moving away from you, but I'm saying moving in your life. Right? This isn't an exhaustive list, but I think it's just a few things. In John, in John chapter 2, he saved a man from shame by turning water into wine. In John chapter 4, he cured the noble man's son. In Mark chapter 1, he cast out an unclean spirit. In Mark, in Mark chapter 1, he cures Peter's mother-in-law of a fever. In Mark chapter 1, he heals a leper. In Luke 7, he raised the widow's son from death. He calmed the storm in Matthew 8. He cured the paralytic in Matthew 9. He opened the eyes of two blind men in Matthew 9. He fed at least 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish in Matthew 14. He cured a deaf man and a mute in Mark chapter 7. In another biblical account, he feeds over 4,000 people with seven loaves and a few fish in Matthew 15. He raises Lazarus from the dead. He caused a fig tree to wither to be able to teach a lesson in Matthew 21. And of course, we know why we celebrate on Easter, because it is Resurrection Sunday. He rose from the dead. And so when you hear all of those examples, and that, again, that's not, we would be here for a long time if we just put everything down that Jesus did recorded in his word. But, but why do I share that? Because it speaks for itself his track record, who he is, how he wants to move. And so we can come with a holy expectation that he's gonna do something supernatural in us and through us because that's his character, that's who he is. His character speaks for itself. Hebrews 13, he's unchanging. In 2 Peter, he's patient towards us. In 1 John, he's light. In Isaiah, he's an everlasting father. In John 3, he gives his very best. In John 14, he's the way, the truth, and the life. He's he's a helper. In Genesis 1, he's the creator. In Isaiah, he's holy. In Numbers 23, what do we see? He cannot lie. In Matthew 5, he's perfect. And in 1 John, he's faithful and just. So, So his word speaks for itself. His character speaks for itself. And understand, he's all this and more. Like, I don't know where the slogan came from. I remember saying it. Uh, this probably was in the 80s, but you'd say, you'd say this, and I don't know why we said it, and we still say it. Some people still say it. All that in a bag of chips. Uh, like, does that mean you got lobster and crab and scallops and a bag of chips? Like, I don't know. I... But he's all that and a bag of chips. He's all that and more. That's who he is. Do you know Jesus didn't have to address her? He, he didn't. He could have just been like, somebody else touched me. Another, another person healed. And he could have kept on walking. Yet it's in that moment where, where he sees her. He notices her. And he exceeds her expectations of healing. But hear me on this. He didn't just give her a healing. He gave her the healer as well. Right? She receives a healing and the healer, because he saw her. And I want you to know today he sees you. He sees you. Out of all the hundreds, if not thousands, we don't know how large the crowd was, but, but it was, he, they thought he would be crushed. Out of all those people there, he saw her. And yes, you're one of 300 and whatever, 20 something, 8 million people on planet Earth. He sees you. He sees you. He sees you amongst the crowd. He sees your pain. He sees your suffering. 
Because not only did he heal her, he healed her. He made sure he freed her from what was happening in culture during the time. She receives a physical healing, but she, she also receives a healing from the oppression that she had been battling with for years of feeling invisible. Because I'm not seen. I can't associate. He sees you. Did you know that God is not wanting to meet your expectations? He's wanting to exceed your expectations. Do we have a level of expectancy? I think sometimes we get so comfortable relying on the natural that we forget we serve a God of the supernatural, a God of miracles, a God of second chances, a God who makes us brave, a God who gives us strength. Right? And I wonder if, and I've said this before, right? what if God only met you at your level of expectation? Right? Do you come expecting for him to move? Do you come expecting him to do something powerful in your life and through your life? And so my, my challenge to you, my questions to you today would be this. Do you need a physical healing? Then reach out. Reach out. Grab his garment. Maybe you're here this morning and you're like, man, my, my marriage needs healed. Reach out. Reach out. Or maybe you're here and there's a, a, a relationship that needs healed. Reach out. Have some fight. Right? I think so often we give up too quick. Like, oh man, my spouse may be mad. I'm not, it's never going to work out. Right? I love that there's a, the, the commandment, that Jesus gave it, right? To, to love God, to love others, and love yourself. So he gives it. He's expecting us to walk in obedience according to his word, yet the people that he has placed in our life, we are unwilling to love. And you're like, no, I'm not unwilling, no, so you choose not to. He's blessed you, he's given you. Yeah, but you don't know my situation. I know the situation of Jesus, I know that he went to the cross and that the word says, yet while we were still sinners, while we were messed up, while we were jacked up, why we seemed in the moment unlovable, he lavished his love, he gave us his love, and ultimately paid the sacrifice on the cross. So as he's giving this love, and then we see in 1 Corinthians 13, because that's what love's all about, right? God is love and love, and, and because he's love, he's all these things. God, you keep no record of wrong. Thank you, Lord, for not keeping all the record of my wrongdoings. And Jesus is like, yes, now go do that to the people you love. Not so easy. And I'm not interested in loving people that way, Lord. You love me that way, but don't ask me to love that way. They offended me. They, they, they disagreed with me. And so now they're dead to me, and I don't ever want to speak to them again. That's exactly how Jesus handled every situation in the scripture. No, he didn't. He gave grace. He gave a grace that sustains us. He didn't give his life so we could just fight with one another. He gave his life so we could experience new life. But that means we have to be willing to fight for his best in our life. That means we have to be willing to not give up. And that means we have to come expecting God to move in such a powerful way, because he will. So stop expecting God to move when he's called you to action. Now, Normal church fashion, you would believe like right now the worship team should be coming back to the stage. Like this is a great moment like to open up the altars and say, listen, God, would you move? I'm, I'm coming with a holy expectation that you're gonna move in, your, in my life. God, I'm, I'm coming and I, I won't leave this altar until you bless me, until you move in my life. So God, I got some fight in me. I'm ready for this battle. I know you're gonna bring the victory. But that's not gonna happen today. You wanna know why? Because I think if we can learn anything from this woman, she didn't wait for a church experience, right? She didn't wait for the altar to be open, to be able to come and chase after the Father. She did it on a normal, every ordinary day. Jesus is coming to town and I wanna meet with him. Jesus is coming to your town, to your house, to your work, and to your life. He doesn't just show up on Sunday. He actually works Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And so we can come expecting, we can come with a passion, we can have a hunger that wakes us up on a Monday morning and goes, God, I'm not going to work until I read my Bible. I'm not, going, I'm not leaving this house until I've spent some time with you. And on my way to work, I'm going to connect with you in worship. Because I love our worship team, but they're not traveling with you tomorrow. But that doesn't mean you go, well, I got to wait till next week then. No, you can connect tomorrow. 
And then on Tuesday, you can come with a hunger. And then on Wednesday, you can actually come hungry and we'll feed you. Nothing but the finest for our RLC, RLC peeps. Hot dogs and chips. Hey, remember, your generosity, your generosity. <laughs> Just teasing. But do we have that kind of hunger that goes, God, I'm expecting you to move on any day and at any moment. I don't have to settle. I don't have to just say, well, God, it's, it's not Sunday and how possible. No, it is possible. All things are possible to those who believe. All things. We're the only state with a motto that says, with God, all things are possible. But do we receive it? And so I think we need to apply the scripture to our life. Say, God, you moved in such a way. So tomorrow, I want you to move, or today even. Like when you leave today, God, I, I have an appetite for you to move. And I know that, w- that we had plans, but, but tonight I'm just going to spend some t- more time with you. And I'm going to chase after you. And I want to reach out to touch the hem of your garment and believe for healing in my marriage. To believe for healing in a relationship. To believe that my son or my daughter would make their way back to faith. Would come home like the prodigal. God, I'm going to reach out and believe that you are, you are the healer. That you see me just like you saw this woman. Do you have that kind of faith? So as we close today, if you want God to move in your life the way he moved in this woman's life, would you just pray with me? Father, today, we do have an expectation, but we don't want to limit you because you're not a, you, we limit ourselves and our own capacity, but God, you are the God of unlimited power and unlimited potential and unlimited healing and unlimited supernatural strength and so lord we come to you expecting a mighty move in our lives but god we don't want to put you in a box and say it has to happen in this way not that that way would be bad but god we want you to move and have the freedom to move in our life on monday through friday god that we would live in such a way god that we would have a holy expectation for you to do something mighty god that we wouldn't give up we would continue to, to strive after, that we would have a persistency that chases after you with, with a hunger, with a passion for more of you in our lives. And God, that we would, we would fight for your very best in our life. God, I pray that the lion that's inside of us would compel us to chase after you with a fierce determination, knowing that you just don't want to meet our expectations. You would like to exceed our expectations. So Lord, help us. Give us the faith, that audacious faith that this woman had. If we could just reach out. God, give us the faith this week to be able to reach out. God, give us the faith to be able to, to not just sit back on the sidelines, but to, but to move in action to love other people the way that you would have us to love them. Empower us, Lord, to be more like you. God, you are good, and we give you thanks in Jesus' name.